a point in Waterville, Maine, where he started his own meat packing house. It was very small. It's called Alco Packing. I think it still exists. Mm -hmm. And it was started by a man named Aaron Levine, a Jew, a working class Jew. And he made it to the legislature and got into the Maine Senate. And every time there was a bill that had mm -hmm. to do with things like workers' compensation or particularly minimum wage, increase in minimum wage, I remember Aaron Levine because I'm sure he raised the ire of a lot of his fellow Republicans because he not only wanted to support those bills, he wanted his name on the bill as a co-sponsor. And a lot of his fellow Republicans, and they certainly, you're right, Troy, they weren't the Tea Party ilk, they were more conservative and more moderate people, and Aaron Levine and Harry Richardson and Ken McLeod from over here in Brewer and a number of other Republicans were on, on Fiscal issues may be more conservative, but when it came to working class, they understood. <coughs> and Aaron Levine summed it up for me, probably the most best manner possible. And when he was besieged by his counterparts in the Republican Party down there in the Senate caucus, he said uh, they, because they berated him for supporting an increase in the minimum wage. And he said, uh, you, you, and he had a bit of a dialect, which I can't do, so I won't even try that. But uh, he came from the old country, so he said, you, uh, you gentlemen forget, and what is all gentlemen there too, uh, you forget what I do for a living. I have a meat packing house. I cut meat. I sell meat. I want people to be able to afford to buy meat and not just cereal. And so he would prevail on a lot of these issues. And, and I think you're right. In so many cases, we've lost that. Uh, but I will tell you, as a Democrat, lifelong Democrat, uh, I would say that there are many in the Democratic Party who have also lost that. They have no clue what it is like to be working class. They were born with, as the former governor of Texas said, with a silver spoon in their mouth. And so when they get to the legislature, whether they're Republicans, Democrats, Greens, or Independents, the people I'm talking about don't really have a whole lot of sympathy for what it's like to have to get up every morning, go to work in a mill, a factory, a shop, a, a dreary office where carpal tunnel is running rampant, all those kinds of things. And they just don't have any sympathy for it. But if you start talking about giving businesses tax breaks, Ah, then it's a whole different story. <laughs> and Shelley Pingree, when she was in the Maine Senate, tried, worked very, very hard, tried to get a provision in those tax break uh, uh, bills and, and laws that said in so many words, each year you're going to have to account for how many people you have hired and what they're, you're paying them for wages in order to be eligible for this tax break. And she was beaten back. And she was beaten back, not only by the people you might suspect would obviously try to beat that back, but some of her own colleagues in the Democratic Party. You know, it's just sad. So I think if you're looking for another argument about working class people should be in the legislature and in places where they're making public policy, I would submit that that's another good case because they're much closer to the reality of working for a living than some people are. Um, I have a question that kind of looks at what people see as um, what's likely to be come, what's likely to be happening in the next, say, 20 to 30 years with the next generation of young people, especially just given that there seem to be so many like 20-somethings <coughs> and 30-somethings who just aren't able to find like stable employment. I mean, it's a terrible economy right now for for young people, and. Um, it just seems like they're even more vulnerable than a lot of us were at that at that age category. And and, and um, how can we how can we take that into account in trying to like in trying to get working class people into office if they're leading such you know unstable existences economically that they can barely think about you know where they're going to get their next meal. I think they should all run for office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, think, I think that's a good point. I think, um, yeah, when I look, think about the next, like, I have a 12-year-old, so in the next 20 to 30 years, like, what happens with the economy? 
really, really something I think about a lot. But like, I think what we have to think about, right? It's like this downward trend started in the 80s. Uh, and it's been sort of 30 plus years of, you know, decline in unions, decline in working people in the main legislature, decline in wages and increase in income inequality, you know, increase in tax rates for the wealthy, increase in property taxes for my grandmother, you know, um, what do we need to do today and tomorrow and next month and in January when the legislature starts and, you know, in January when campaigning starts for the 2014 <laughs> ballot. Like, what do we need to be doing to, to make sure that in 20 years we have a different economic picture in our communities and that we aren't in this place that we're in right now because it, it's not an accident that over the last 30 years we've got where we are today and so and it it was orchestrated through a set of policies and through getting people elected and you know making sure that you know policies were passed and people were lobbied in the way that they needed to be lobbied. I mean, your point about like term limits, right? It is. It's the, it's the lobbyists. I mean, I have more of an institutional mm -hmm. knowledge of the state house than some people who are state house serving on committee, you know, because mm -hmm. I've been paying attention and involved for a while, you know? This guy certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and so that's the thing with term limits is like the folks with the institutional knowledge are the paid lobbyists. So we're the political junkies. But, but I think this is why it's so important to elect working class people right. in political offices. Yeah, lobbyists are <coughs> always going to have a leg up, whether you've got term limits or not. You've got to find politicians who are lobby proof. You've got to find politicians mm -hmm. who you can throw all the money at that you want at them, and they won't throw the working class under the bus. Mm -hmm. And lots of progressives say to me, why do you care about electing working class people when you can get someone who has the same issue positions who has got a law degree from Harvard? And I say because I know that that you know, you, you, you know that I can show you the data. Those people can be rolled. Those people can be flipped. Uh, uh, but you get a working class person with the with the same issue positions uh, when they start out, and they're going to stick to their guns. Uh, uh, there, uh, I, I think you want to beat the lobbyists. You don't play their game. You don't try to throw more money at the chamber or at the legislator that the chamber of commerce does. You find a legislator that the Chamber of Commerce can't buy. Uh, I think it's, it's you know. I, I agree. I think that it, it comes down to heart, you know, as far as legislators. And, and I mean, you know, now it's my job to find people to run for the, you know, the Democratic caucus. But you know, it, it's always hard to know. But you know, like I got started, uh, like I said, you know, with 15 other men. Uh, you know, blocking the border. We didn't know what w was going to happen to us. Well, you know, we were all prepared to, you know, be taken away because we were fed up with the way things were going. And and uh, when that, you know, type of mentality, you know, happens when you know you're you're all in with other people, uh, you know, they did. They they came to some of us and well, you know, we'll give you a contract and we'll do this and we'll do that. Well, you, you know, it's. For me, anyways, was you know, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything that was going to go against those other guys because we all were, you know, fighting for the same thing, and 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 I think that's you know what you try and find those type of people where, you know, they really have their heart into it. They're trying to do the best they can for their area. They love their community. They they want to do the best they can for uh, people like them, and, and those are the people, like you said, are that are lobby proof. Uh, you know, I mean. I certainly have talked. I mean, one of the things that I've, you know, come to understand better as as a legislator is that you know I always try and listen, regardless of if the people that uh, that uh, are coming to talk to me. I like to listen to their arguments because you know if I'm 100% against them, then I know what they're going to use. But sometimes, uh, you know, they actually have a point that that makes me think that well, you know, that's something I hadn't considered. Uh, so maybe I, I do uh, change my opinion on it, but for the most part, you know, I mean, there's core issues that, you know, there would be nothing they could say to me that would make me change my mind. Uh, but, but uh, you know, finding people in Maine, and they're, they're there, I mean, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we have, we have great people in the state. Uh, sometimes one of the, the things that seems to uh, 
uh, hold people back. Uh, there's a mentality here in Maine that, you know, I just want to work hard and, and, you know, I don't want to cause any trouble and stuff like that. Well, you know, running for the legislature and, and, and advocating for what you believe in is not really causing trouble. Some people will say that, uh, that it is, but, uh, you know, I think that's just standing up for what you believe in, and that's okay. And, and you have to let people understand that and know it. And, and like it was said earlier, you know, I got first got elected, I think there's 74 new uh, people in the House with me. And to be really honest, you know, I mean, I was independent then. I didn't have anyone in the party helping me or anything like that, but I just looked around and could tell that everyone else didn't know what they were doing there either. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just started acting like I did. <laughs> Mark? Yeah, I have a question that might sort of put it as a fourth dimension. We've got the campaign financing, getting the vote out, getting working class people in office. If you, if you look back at American history and when there have been waves of progressive legislation, the New Deal, Wagner Act, uh, Great Society legislation, were the proportions of working class people in the legislatures higher than And if not, what accounts for that progressivity? Is it not uh, the rise of the labor movement in the 30s, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and all those movements of the 60s that even if you had these Harvard lawyers that could be flipped, they didn't dare be flipped because there were people out in the streets who were going to hold them accountable. Yeah. And isn't that another dimension that we also have to focus on to make this all work? And that will also give rise to people from the working class who will be wanting to run for office coming well, out yeah. of those movements. But, yeah, social movements yeah. and organizing, like, well, always need to be there to put pressure on anybody that's in power. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where, you know, we find people who will lead and I agree. I mean, the 125th legislature was a perfect example. I mean, the, the, you know, and, and forgive me for being partisan, I wasn't always like that, but you know, <laughs> they had the House, they had the Senate, they had the Governor's Office. They could have put any policy they wanted in place. And, and while there was a lot of us that were, you know, fighting as hard as we could, getting up, you know, time after time on the Senate floor and the House floor, even, even though we didn't have the numbers, what made the difference was people showing up at the State House. I mean, when those people were out in the hall chanting and, and, and you had to walk a gauntlet down to get into the House of Senate, that's why they couldn't get their, their crazy policies through. Not because of, you know, me or John Patrick or Justin Alphon getting up. And, I mean, that certainly maybe reinforced it, but it was the mob of people out in the hall that were mad and, 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 and they had right to be mad. So I, I think that exactly what you said, I mean, it. it Absolutely fine, great legislation, but people have to be involved in their government at all times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the places where this works the best are where you actually put all these things together. So, so I didn't, by describing them as separate goals, I didn't mean to say that we should pursue them separately. I think look at what Unite Here did in New Haven. It was a combination of they were getting seed money, they were recruiting working class candidates, they were getting people to the polls, and they were also organizing. and and, and those are all important individually, but then when you put them all together, all of a sudden you've taken over uh, the board of aldermen of, of, uh, of an important city, and so so I think yeah, uh, you know, uh, by talking about these as separate goals, uh, uh, I, I want to highlight that it takes a slightly different set of tools to achieve each one, but I think you get the best outcome when you when you when you put them all together at once. You know, and I would just add. Um, I talk to a lot of young people. I have good fortune of being able to be in places where, you know, students and, and young people, a lot of them workers who are not students, would like to be students, can't afford it. And uh, uh, they tell me, and it's, and it's rather sad, but they don't think the system is working for them. They really believe that the system is corrupt, that there is nothing good in it, that they don't want to participate because they don't want to be part of a broken system and so they're doing other things they're volunteering in, in all kinds of areas and uh, working like that and I see these people as really looking for some encouragement and an almost a sense of direction and as much as it pains me to say this especially in this hallowed hall the labor temple I don't see the labor movement working aggressively to seek out young people 
and get them involved in meaningful ways. I mean, they, there's some of that going on, and some unions, quite frankly, are much better than others. But I have the same issue with my own political party. I do not see them being very welcoming. I see office holders saying, <coughs> you don't want to encourage them too much. Next thing you know, they'll be running for my position. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but that's exactly what we ought to be that's doing. Point. And there's a lot of us in this room who would not be where we are today but for somebody who came along, encouraged us, told us to get involved, and, and they, were, they were people we thought highly of and respected, and we did that. And as a result of it, you know, we're still involved. I would look around the room and say, every one of us in this room are somehow involved in the political process, not necessarily as labor people or union people, but we're involved and we care about it and we watch what's going on and we try to keep it formed. And I think what we ought to do is give that legacy. It's a rich legacy. And I think we ought to pass it on to those who are about to follow. I mean, yeah, I think with younger folks, um, like especially the younger working families that I work with, um, those are some of the most magical leaders that I've developed in the last few years. They're like people who are really disenfranchised, who understand that something's not right, who have that feeling that the system is broken and they, they don't want to engage in it because, you know, their grandmother just got lost their prescription drug coverage and, you know, they don't understand, they don't, a lot, most most of the folks that I, I'm working with now, when I met them, didn't know who their House or Senator, this House Rep or Senator were and were not engaging. But it, um, it's moving them from doing like direct service volunteering, so like planting a garden or helping out at the homeless shelter, to the kind of volunteering and leadership development that is meaningful and movement building, um, which is small steps, when we're talking, one of the questions here is like, what specific steps can we take? It's more organizing, more leadership development, more basic civics education in our communities, because like, civic engagement is a term that gets thrown around a lot, um, whether it's in higher education or schools. Um, but for us, when at Maine People's Resource Center, when we think about civic education, <coughs> engagement and do civic engagement, it's you know, voter registration, it's political education in low-income communities and communities of color. Um, it's training, it's helping people understand the process so that it's not as scary or as foreign. Like, I hear a lot, the system is broken, it's not working, there's nothing I can do to fix it. And I'm like, well, let me tell you how this system works and where do we engage and how do you get 500 people in the halls singing the same song? <laughs> 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 Jim, uh, Valerie, and then Jim. I was just going to make one quick comment. I think I mean, part of what we're talking about here is, is combating a, a feeling of powerlessness among people. And I think if we could deal with that, I think that might help the rates of, of substance abuse and drug addiction we have, you know, that I think are mm -hmm. partly a symptom of, of just people feeling powerless and estranged from the community around them. Um, and just so I think like that's a big piece of it. So many yeah. people are economically just deprived in this region right now, and yeah. you see people who are on drugs downtown right. every day. Right. And it's a lack of economic opportunity, it's a lack of education, it's a lack of good, decent paying jobs and a living wage, and it's, you know, I, you know, Nick's, Nick's research shows that it's directly related to the lack of, you know, working class people in making policy. 